you're so smart. I'm so glad you prepare for these things. You know, right? Bullet so lists you made, and- you said two things very sarcastically there. One of them I was okay with, one of them not so much. But yeah, I'm so glad you're so prepared thing. That was fine. But, oh, you're so smart. That one stung a little. <laughs> you're so smart, Michael. Oh, boy. You know, I've listened to a couple episodes where you poke fun at your own intelligence. So that's different. Hello, and welcome to Middle-ish, the podcast about moderation in all things. I am Erin Green. And I am Michael Bray. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's morning for both of us. Sunshine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're doing Bright this morning thing lately. It's two weeks in a row that we're... Okay, well, two weeks in a row, three podcast recording attempts. We tried to record yeah. a couple of days ago. And about seven minutes in, my transformer blew here. <laughs> I lost all my power. So we we're like, well, let's try again another day. Yeah. And it just so happens that morning, morning works. Morning works out. I hope it works for all of you too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dicey because sometimes Michael and I are not quite, um, with it fully functioning in the morning. I think I am, I've been awake for seven hours and just preparing for this episode. So I don't know what your problem is, Aaron, but I am ready to go. Okay. Well, so I, I guess we know who the overachiever of of the duo is i'll be honest i don't think anyone has ever accused me of being an overachiever <laughs> boy he really goes above and beyond doesn't he <laughs> well i think our audience knows by now that i'm the one who is the like super type a let's make a bullet list for everything and let's get really organized and probably overthink and over prepare <clears throat> except for lately that's me I've been like rubbing off on air and (laughs) she's showing up like, whatever, what's the topic? What are we doing? Let's do it. Yeah. What are we talking about? (laughs) Maybe I'll like, make sure I pull up a few items while we're chit chatting here. It's contagious. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So how are you? Not bad. Um, yeah, we had a little interesting, um, evening on Wednesday night. And I just wanted to talk about this because I think it's such a rare thing that I wonder if any of our listeners have heard about this, um, condition Matt has what's called Meniere's disease. Mm. Have you ever heard of it? I have a few times, but I couldn't tell you what it is. It's very rare and it's a condition of the inner ear. Um, basically the, the fluid in the ear, um, doesn't drain the proper way. And there's a membrane in the inner ear that is supposed to keep these two fluids separate. Um, and with Meniere's disease, you have a malfunction in there. And so what happens is the individual can have, um, severe nausea, vertigo, and vomiting when they have an episode where that membrane becomes, um, I don't know if it, it ruptures. I think it ruptures anyway. It took, I mean, he's been dealing with this for years. I think he got his first, um, episode back. He was having like some fainting spells and we took him in to get like cardiac workup and a CT scan and all this stuff Mm -hmm. just to make sure it wasn't like a tumor or something, you know, something really serious and they couldn't really find anything. So he went to an ear, nose, nose and throat doctor, And, um, the, they referred him to a PT that actually does this maneuver called the Epley maneuver. And this is like some witch doctor stuff. It's like playing the marble game with your ear. So you have these little crystals in your inner ear. And if you pass out or hit your head really hard, they can become dislodged. Mm -hmm. And that crystal is kind of rolling around in the wrong spot. And so these PTs will like roll it around your little windy tube in your ear and play the marble game with these little crystals. I'm not Uh, making this up. This is a thing. Google the Epley maneuver and they, and it puts the crystal back in the right spot so it can be resorbed into your body and then recycled, you know, to make new crystals. So he had that done 
it took care of a lot of the vertigo and dizziness and things that he was having. And then he kept having these other episodes where the most severe one that he had, the first one was like, in I don't know, I think it was 2015 or something where he literally came home from work and was just uncontrollably vomiting. Any noise yeah. would make him vomit. No, he just laid on the floor of the bathroom, just like it, motionless because any movement would make him severely ill. So this is what Jeez. it ha- This is what happens with a Meniere's attack or episode is the person is literally incapacitated. And so he had, and he's only had like three really severe ones like that. And Mm -hmm. one of them happened on Wednesday. So it was this whole fiasco. He was at work too. And so I rode my bike out there so I could drive him home, but he couldn't be moved. Like he was just so sick. Um, and there are, you know, like Benadryl can help and, bonine, like motion sickness medication. And he's had a couple prescriptions that can help, but he was out of his prescriptions. And so then it's after hours and I'm like trying to call doctors to get, you know, this prescription that can help. Anyway, it was just, it was a whole nightmare, but, um, so he's, he's doing much better. And I think it's something, you know, whenever I tell people about this, they're like, oh yeah, I've never heard of Meniere's disease. Unless you talk to somebody who knows someone who has it and they're like, holy crap, that stuff is so bad. I know what it's like. You know, I've, I've witnessed the episodes. And so, um, just a, wow. a shout out of solidarity to those of you who might be dealing with that and, um, or know someone who is it really sucks. Seriously. Ugh. That sounds terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's so, okay today. He's doing, he's doing much better. This happened Wednesday. So he, he usually feels really hungover and exhausted the day or two after one of those really severe episodes. Mm-hmm. And, um, some of it is just like the medication that he has to like Benadryl makes sure. him drowsy, you know, and yeah. like some bonine, sometimes the motion sickness stuff makes you drowsy. And so I think that's some of it, but it's also just like this, you're, inner ear is just out of whack. And so you're like your balance and your hearing is kind of affected by it. Um, so yeah, he's doing better. He's, he's getting there, but, ah, oh, man, I know man. sucky deal. Sorry. Imagine, imagine having the tequila spins only 10 times worse and they don't just go away when you fall asleep. Yeah. It's like endless. Doesn't that sound like purgatory? I think it sounds awful. Uh, it doesn't sound like a fun time to me. No. No. Yeah. No. So not a good time. This is kind of, kind of what happens. Well, tell him so that he's feeling better and hope he's yeah. back on top of it real soon. Thank you. He will. Yeah. Rally. Rally is helping. He's being a good nurse, laying there. Good. You know, like a dead weight whenever Kitty there's a cuddles. human nearby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if he's spinning, then Rally can hold him down can anchor him. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, rally doesn't have as much outdoor time now. So he's a heavier anchor. <laughs> so, so he can do his job. Well, uh, well, good. Good for rally. How's your yeah. week been? <clears throat> oh, it's been good. My parents were in town. They came in last week. They left this morning. Um, we had a great time this weekend. We went down to the town home in Galveston and stayed a few nights and played oh, at the beach right. yeah. and the pool and all that stuff. And just, yeah, had a really good time. It was Sophie's birthday on Tuesday. So mm-hmm. she's five now, which is wild. Oh my gosh. I saw the pictures on Facebook. Oh, she's yeah. such a cutie. She's, she's so freaking cute. Yeah. She it's tripping me out because she is now the age that Lila was when Sophie was born. And that just whole oh, thing. Oh, wow. Is, it's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Like, how are we here already? But yeah, no, it was a great week. Had a good time with them. Um, my mom just texted me a little bit ago. They're stuck on the runway. They shut the plane off because bad weather. They're like, yeah, we're just going to conserve oh, no. fuel because we're going to be here for a bit. Like nobody's coming oh, in. And no. out right so oh, that sucks. Geez. My mom was like, we could be with you guys still. <laughs> so, oh, shoot. So, so hopefully they get off soon. Things get cleared it's up. always so lame when you like rush to the airport after having yeah. a great time somewhere and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, it's time to leave. You finally haul all your bags and you get through and, and there's a delay or something. Yeah. And you're just like, man, if I had known this, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and then it messes up the whole day sometimes because you miss connecting flights. And so you have to right. just, yeah, yep. it turns into this headache, whole freaking long thing. Yeah. But we had a great mm-hmm. time. It was super fun. Really good time. The girls love it. I mean, they just, gosh, they spoil those girls when they're here. It's, it's fun. Super Naturally. Fun. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Why not? So things are good. Things are good. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, do you want to, you want to dive in? Yeah, let's get started. Let's get it started in hot. Let's get it started in here. Little okay, we're piece. gonna introduce the yeah, we're gonna introduce the topic before yeah. Michael breaks into song too much. Uh he already did, so I'll tell <laughs> too <you>. late. <laughs> <laughs> Today's topic, everybody, we are talking about nutrient timing specifically for exercise, but then I think you know there's there's some takeaways just for the average person that you know, may or may not have a workout throughout the day and may or may not be super focused on exercise performance. But I think this topic is something that is, um, misunderstood, like a lot of the things we talk about. And also sometimes, um, overemphasized, you know, like, oh, you have to do this within yeah. 30 minutes of whatever. And, you know, pe- people you lose all your gains, <laughs> yeah. gains like with if, a Z. If you eat it 32 minutes after your workout, it's pointless. Like, okay. Screwed. <laughs> yeah, right. There's some real intensity behind this for some people. <laughs> yeah. There's some, there's a lot of, uh, hypervigilance with yeah. the nutrition world some and exercise. dogma we can say. <laughs> yeah. But there are also some very sound recommendations that are, I mean, pretty easy to follow. And I would say widely applicable to just about everyone. And, and I invite you as we kind of go through some of this conversation to just make some observations within yourself and determine like Mm -hmm. what works best for you, because every, we've said this a thousand times, everybody's a little different everyone has a, you know, different foods that work for them or different routines. And maybe your schedule, um, you know, has variable demands day to day. Right. So keep that in mind. Yeah. And for me, this is a little similar to like the, uh, what was it? Meal planning episode mm-hmm. we did in that for some people, it may be appropriate to be real strict and have some real fixed guidelines. Um, for other people, what may be appropriate under that meal plan umbrella is like, Hey, let me plan a lunch or a dinner, or just have an idea of what I'm going to eat through the week. And so with nutrient timing, I think, you know, like if you're performing at a, at a specific level, um, this can get pretty important. You know what I mean? We're looking for optimal performance for some people, maybe a lot of us, um, nutrient timing can be more like, Hey, you know what? If I, if I eat these foods before I workout, I just feel stronger in the gym. Or if I eat these, you know, foods at, later on in the evening, I don't sleep well, you know, just like paying attention yeah. to kind of how your body interacts with certain foods at different times in the day around different activities. And not that it's a strict, like nutrient timing down to the, you know, gram, but just more like that. This seems to work better for me at this time or before these things. So I think there's a broad umbrella here that, that you know, we're going to talk about too. Yep. So I think we could just start with kind of reviewing the macronutrients, Um, we have a whole episode on that. If you want to go back, I don't know, Michael, do you have, you're usually really good at that. You know, which episode it is. That's just because I look ahead, but I will, I will about the macros. That was the episode. It was titled all about the macros. So you've got three primary macronutrients. Okay. There's carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Um, Episode 62. Alcohol. Episode 62. Thank you. It wasn't that long ago. Is this 72 if, that we're recording? What are we recording 71. now? 71? I think this is 71. Okay. So, so nine weeks ago. It feels longer than okay. that, doesn't it? I know. Yeah. yeah. We just okay, got so, so the, many episodes under our belt. We, we are just so many words. Oh, geez, Lots it's of just words. Hard, hard being <laughs> us. <laughs> so prolific with our wisdom. Really? So the macronutrients, okay. This is basically what your body uses for fuel. Um, they provide calories. So carbohydrates, four calories per gram, protein, four calories per gram and fat, nine calories per gram. We talked a little bit about alcohol. Um, technically it's not considered a macronutrient, even though it provides calories because it's not essential. We don't need it. Um, but it's seven Mm. calories per gram. Let's not get carried away. I know we could get, 
Michael's going to start adjusting his hat soon. If we, if we say you don't need whiskey. All right, let's talk about the need for alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we so, don't need it. Uh, we need it, right? <laughs> there's this really great graphic that I like to use. And I, I think I referenced it in the macronutrient episode. I'm going to bring it up again. It's actually out of a child feeding book by Ellen Satter. Um, Ellen, E-L-L-Y-N, Satter with a double T. She is kind of like the fairy godmother of child feeding. I've mentioned her before on this podcast, mm-hmm. just because she's so great with her, you know, pragmatic approach and just her conversational way of, of conveying this very evidence-based information. And she has a really great, um, graphic. In fact, I can pull it up for those of you watching YouTube, and then I'll just make sure that I link it somehow in, in the show notes for the, for the episode. Um, basically it's showing the macronutrients and kind of how our bodies digest them and how over time they contribute to satiety. So here it is. I'm going to share my screen for those of you. Cause I say you can share, right? I can. Okay, good. Um, sorry, Zoom is giving me some fits on being able. Oh, you have disabled. So, you have disabled screen sharing. I am not allowed. Well, so this graph I'm going to share. It. Uh, maybe I it didn't says you've it. disabled. It says you've disabled. Oh, it. I definitely did not do that. Where so do this I... graph. <laughs> I don't know. I'll let you figure it out while I describe this well, graph. Tell me what it is, and I'll share it. Can you like I mean, tell you what it is? Well, I, I can share it. Tell me what the graphic is. Can you pop the link in the chat and then I can pull it up? Oh, it's a file on my computer. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah. So, okay. I'm just going to describe it. Sorry about that. You guys. So basically we're looking at an X, Y axis and on one scale, there's satisfaction. And then on the other scale, there's time. So we're looking at basically satisfaction over time. And we have four components here. We have sugar, starch, okay, carbohydrates, and then we have protein and fat. So if you can imagine this X, Y axis, if you eat sugar, you have very rapid satisfaction, but it also plummets with, with time, with a short period of time. Okay. So you have this really, um, tall spike and then a deep plummet. I think I might have access to sharing it. Yeah, now. Try now. Let me try it. Try this again. Host. As it should be. There we go. So then you have starch next. Okay. So it takes a little bit longer for you to get that satisfaction response with starch. It lasts a little longer, but it still drops off pretty quickly in a relatively short period of time. And of course, with starch, we're talking potatoes, corn, beans, um, even pastas and whole grain breads, that kind of stuff. All right. Next we have protein. So this would be like, if you just ate a chicken breast or you just ate a, you know, couple scrambled eggs or something like that. Yeah. You might have a mix of fat in there, but it's primarily protein that you're eating. It'll take longer to reach that satisfaction. It also lasts longer. Okay. So it's somewhere in the middle and then fat is the very last thing. So fat is the last nutrient that actually triggers that satisfaction response in your body. And when I'm saying satisfaction, I'm talking about the hormonal cascade that I'm being fed, um, how that cascade kind of reaches your brain and, and tells your brain, like, yes, we're getting the nutrients we need. And remember your brain runs off of glucose. And so that yeah. primarily, I mean, yeah, we could get Those, into the ketone argument, but we're not going to fall <laughs> Exactly. The cues yeah. that, that feel, um, I've heard it described as like a sense of well being. You become a little bit more relaxed. You stop thinking about food as much. Maybe the flavor of food kind of becomes a little bit more, um, blunted, I guess, or, you know, just less yeah, unpleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you're when just you're getting towards the end of something, it's like, uh, it's going to be work to finish this. Yeah. 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 So then fat is the, the most delayed satisfaction. And it is the last thing to leave your stomach and be digested. So it's longer lasting satisfaction. So when you look at this graph, and if you're looking on, 
um, YouTube, you should be able to see it again. I will find a way to link it in the show notes. It just shows how the composition of a meal acts as a nice little overlap and bridge of satisfaction all the way through over time. Okay. Now the one thing that's missing on this graph is fiber. And I would probably put fiber somewhere around protein in terms of when you eat fibrous foods. I mean, often they are associated with other carbohydrates. And so they'll probably have a, you know, a little bit quicker satisfaction response, but it's also longer lasting. So it's probably somewhere along the protein lines. When you look at this graph now, I like to share this because when I'm working with athletes, I, you know, I'll show this to them and then I'll say, okay, so what do you think, how, how do you think you would use this information to fuel your body? And naturally they're like, well, you know, I'm not going to eat too much fat close to a workout because that's going to take so long for me to, you know, digest and, and it'll be the longest lasting. Um, I might aim more towards like sugar starch with a little bit of protein. Um, but then it also shows the importance of having all the components to a meal, all of those things, because you not only get that early satisfaction, but then you have these other macronutrients that are longer lasting. And so it's a much more smooth satisfaction over time instead of like this, you know, quick rush of energy and then a crash or on the opposite end, you start eating and you don't feel very satisfied until much, much later on, um, which would be like the really high fat diet. So, right. um, again, this isn't anything to, you know, rail against like low carb, high fat or keto or any of that stuff. We, we, we have plenty of time to do that <laughs> at a later point, but you know, um, we keep talking about a keto episode. I think we just need to do it. I think we need to do it. We'll put <laughs> yeah. it on there. Yeah. Um, the, the main thing about this is I think to understand no matter what dietary approach you choose, and we will talk a little bit about how some athletes are going toward that, you know, low carb, high fat approach, and just will kind of touch on a little bit of the research there, no matter what dietary approach you choose, this is very basic human physiology. Like this mm -hmm. isn't, you know, propaganda. She's not promoting a specific type of diet. She's literally just saying, this is how your physiology is designed to work and mm -hmm. how we respond to eating certain macronutrients. So I think that's just something to keep in mind, because if you do decide to go more toward like low carb, high protein, high fat kind of diet, just know that this satisfaction and satiety factor over time mm -hmm. is just going to be different for you. Right. And that's good to know, you know, like if you, if you are doing low carb, like, listen, you, you may need to just hold off and wait it out until you feel full a little bit. And if you're doing mm -hmm. something lower fat, like you just need to know that, Hey, you might be hungrier than you normally are sooner, you know, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And that's just good to be aware of. Do you know, are there sort of like, um, basic guidelines for like, roughly how long, I mean, it's super individual to the person, but just in general, mm -hmm. like how long before fullness cues kick in with protein or fat? What, like once they've oh, been, man. um, you know, I don't know if they've looked at yeah. very specific times. Um, I'm sure there is research saying like, these are the hormones that are signaled, you know, in this amount of time. And usually it has to do with like insulin and glucagon and all this like balance of different, how your blood sugar plays out. Um, I would probably guess that protein would be, you know, anywhere from like, you know, 20 to 30 minutes in mm -hmm. would probably, and it might even be sooner than that. You know, it doesn't really elicit that, that, you know, quick, insulin response or anything like that. Um, it's and raise your blood sugar, but there are other signals that happen more in the gut. Like once that food breakdown starts in the gut, it's not, you know, that blood sugar response, it's this other cascade mm -hmm. of hormones that kind of signals your right. body that you're feeling fuller. So, I mean, I invite people to experiment with it. If people are really curious about this, particularly athletes, I'll, I'll say like, okay, well, let's try, you know, serve different comp compositions mm -hmm. of meals and snacks and see how you feel and write down like how long it takes for you to start feeling satisfied. Or if you were, you know, still feeling peckish and hungry, you mm -hmm. know, after eating like just a spoonful of peanut butter kind of thing. So, Wait, so are you suggesting 
that it's okay to like have a goal and then change it and adapt it if you need to. You don't have to get it right, right this first time. Is that what you're telling me right now? It's a wild notion, but I think that's exactly what I am saying. I'm shocked. I know. (laughs) This is heresy, my friend. (laughs) It's a very middle-ish concept, but... (laughs) How goes dare you? I don't know who you think you are. Everything in the fitness and diet industry. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So basically so, at uh, its core, it's not rigid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit, or you want to talk a little bit about just kind of um, planning for exercise yeah. um, and that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, I, I really haven't worked with uh, like high level athletes like Aaron has. And so I don't have the experience in getting real particular with those kind of things and feeling for longer events and that kind of stuff. So we probably have a little bit different perspective, which is good because we're, you know, maybe working with different people a little bit, but um, you know, for me, I think there's kind of where I start. If someone is feeling like they just don't have what they need throughout a workout or feel like, you know, they're, they're tapering off towards the end of it, feeling real drained afterwards is to play a little bit. Like Aaron said, like, let's just try some things, you know? Um, I think it's a really good idea to have something in your system, um, Mm -hmm. within an hour or two. Um, you know, I like to have people have some kind of carbohydrate and some kind of protein. It seems to be a pretty good mix for people, um, Mm -hmm. to have like, because you get that quicker energy, right? Like we just saw on the graph and the protein kicks in and kind of sustains you a little bit more, helps you feel fuller a little bit longer, um, helps control that blood sugar, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think things like, you know, some, some carbohydrates, oatmeal, you know, bread, fruit, you know, that kind of thing are are good options. And then something simple, you know, I don't know anyone that really likes to work out on a real full stomach. So Mm -hmm. if you're going to eat close to a workout, I think something smaller is a little better. If you're going to, you know, eat maybe an hour and a half or two before you can maybe get away with something a little bit bigger, but some kind of protein near protein shake eggs, you know, some sort of meat, depending on what time of day you're, you're going to work out. But I also think it's important just to play with it. You know, I've had Mm -hmm. some people that have early morning workouts. have had like a shake and a piece of fruit and that maybe was too much for them. You know, like it just, mm-hmm. it felt too much. And it was, I didn't have time to digest as much when I got into the gym at five 30, cause they're not getting up at three 30 to eat. Right. Yep. So, you know, maybe it was a bit too much. Maybe the liquid feels a little bit too full and kind of sloshy, you know, when we're mm-hmm. moving around a lot, um, maybe a piece of fruit. Cause I mean, fruit can take up a lot of space. Maybe it's like, yeah, let's try half a banana, you know, let's just yeah. play around with it. Um, I think it's good to have something in you especially if you, you know, if you haven't eaten the day, especially like those morning workouts, it's good to get a little something in you because working with a lot of people at 5.00 AM, 5.30 AM, if they don't, a lot of times six o'clock comes around and we're 30 minutes into that workout Mm -hmm. and they're just tanking. They just don't have what they need because they haven't eaten since, you know, seven o'clock the previous night or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Those are, that's a really great summary of preparing yourself for exercise and basically, you know, having that substantial meal three or four hours prior to starting your workout. And then as you get closer, you can still have some combinations of foods. You know, you might have like fruit with cottage cheese. You might have crackers, you know, with some peanut butter. I mean, there's so many different ways you could have like a little snack wrap with some chicken and again, whatever works for you. And then as you get really close to that workout, so like you just said, where you have that 5 30 AM workout and you're not getting up, you know, two hours before to eat something, (laughs) you might just want to have something very small. And you know, the, the research suggests that even hundred calories going into that workout is, is enough to basically wake up your body and kind of signal like, Hey, it's time to start digesting. And which basically I mean, kind of reboots your metabolism after that long fast. And remember that we talked about this, I think in just our menopause episode, how if you are restricting too much or you're, you're going into exercise unfueled. So that morning scenario is the perfect scenario. If you're waking up and you're just going straight into a fasted workout, sure. We have this whole fat adaptation camp who is encouraging that kind of stuff because, Hey, it teaches your body to rely on fat and, you know, for fuel. Well, okay. I will give you that. There's some evidence that says, sure, we could go into a workout fasted and that those shifts might happen. Particularly for women though, we see that 
we have an elevated cortisol already when we wake up. And then if you're in an unfed state, you have a higher cortisol spike and then you have latent hunger throughout the day mm -hmm. and your body just isn't able to really make use of that workout in, in the best way. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of saying like, like you said, have half a banana, you know, have a couple spoonfuls of yogurt, have a handful of whole grain cereal, you know, mm -hmm. have like a, a stinger waffle or whatever your sport food of choice is going into that workout simply. So your body is getting that signal that like, Hey, we have energy here so we can, mm -hmm. you know, start putting into motion, all of the things that are going to make this workout successful. So, yeah, yeah. It really doesn't take much, just a little bit mm -mm. can go a long yeah. way. Yeah. And I say usually a workout over an hour long, you definitely need to have fuel mm -hmm. going into that workout. If you have just a short workout, like, I mean, I work with a lot of triathletes, right? So they might wake up and just have like a quick 30 minute run. If, if someone, I mean, running in particular can cause GI upset, and this is, uh, you know, strongly associated in women and especially as we age and especially depending on the menstrual cycle. So there's a lot of things happening sure. here with, with women in particular that are going like for a morning run. So if a client says, man, I just cannot eat anything. I feel much better. If I just go run on my empty stomach, I'm like, fine do that. So long as it's, you know, we're looking at the duration and paying attention to how long this is. Um, and then we'll talk about recovery nutrition and the timing of that and the composition of that here in a little bit. Um, but that becomes paramount if somebody right. is going into a workout fasted. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go under recovery? Yeah. Well, actually yeah. let's talk about, um, during, during okay. the workout um, fueling peri which, workout, peri workout. <laughs> um, I think for a lot of people, it's a non issue because you're simply going to the gym or you're meeting your friends for a, a run. And it's for a lot of people, it's an hour or less. It's not a huge deal. You might need to take a bottle of water with you. Um, hydration, I think is always something to consider for anybody who's going for a workout. Um, just water will serve totally fine for most people. If you're profusely sweating, if you have two a days, or if you're working out for really long periods of time, especially in heat or humidity, then we might want to look at electrolytes, sports drinks, um, those kinds of products. Um, but in general water helps, you know, keep you from getting cotton mouth, whatever. And, yeah. um, yeah. So for longer activities, you know, basically there's, there's this wide range of recommendations, but it is very much solid that carbohydrates are your body's preferred fuel during exercise. Okay. More so, heresy. I know, I know sacrilege. So anywhere from 30 grams per hour to 90 grams per hour is what the literature says should be taken in during during exercise and 90 is basically the max that your intestine can absorb. Now it's important to, to hear, because sometimes people hear, well, I'm a big guy, so I need more carbohydrates per hour. Well, I mean, we can try that, but intestinal absorption of carbohydrates is independent of body weight. So we see that like, this is like a human nutrition thing that absorption up to 90 grams per hour. Now I have some athletes that swear they can tolerate more and they, they don't have gut issues. Um, I've met an athlete who is diabetic and he takes like, I think he eats like 700 calories an hour in MCT oil. So he has a very specific. Yeah. And I was like, wait, you've got to be kidding me. And he's like, no, he's very scientific about it. And this is something that has been developed over time for him. Um, wow. And it's, it's, re, it's remarkable to me because I'm just like, whoa, this is totally different than, you know, the, just the basic exercise mm -hmm. nutrition physiology. Um, I throw that out there just to say that there are some outliers and there's a lot of room for you to experiment for what works for you. If it's working for you, whatever you're doing, then do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't, don't say like, well, the sports dietitian right. says this, you know, this is what the Let recommendations I read. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do that. If it works for you. I mean, I've known 
uh, pro triathletes that eat trail mix on the bike and everything in sports nutrition would say, no, don't do that. It's, you know, higher fat. There's plenty of fiber in there. These are two nutrients that we don't encourage athletes to eat during exercise, but it, it works. So I'm just saying here are the recommendations, 30 to 90 grams of carbs per hour. Of course, that 90 is for like the super long stuff. So if you're doing sure. like century bike rides, or you're doing Ironman or marathon training, anything like that, you might want to go toward that upper end. If you're just doing like a longer workout and you happen to be out for, you know, 90 minutes or something like that, you might kind of start with that lower end and just, there's lots of different options for you. You can use real food, which would be like bananas or pretzels or applesauce or fruit leather, or, you know, there's just lots of different options, or you can go to sports food, which would be like the gels and the chews and sports drinks and things like that. So, um, yeah, just keep it, keep it pretty simple. Stick to those carbohydrate foods for the most part, unless you think that you're one of those outliers that has trouble with blood sugar control. And, and that actually brings us to reactive hypoglycemia that we we were talking about that just before we came on. Yeah. We can go there. Yeah. It's, that's a fancy word of way of saying feeling poopy during exercise. (laughs) (laughs) Not literally poopy because that's a whole nother thing too. (laughs) No, that would be, that would be Perry workout diarrhea. Not that this is a different, (laughs) the runners trots, (laughs) (laughs) the runners runs, (laughs) runners runs, runny runs, runny runs. Yeah. Oh boy. So this is, this is essentially, uh, just blood sugar kind of taken during exercise, which I don't think is a, like a really widespread problem, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of the things that I, I noticed happening to me before I was diagnosed, like I would come home and I would just feel not great. You know, Mm -hmm. I just feel, wouldn't feel good. I felt kind of woozy, super hungry, kind of disoriented and just like, what is going on? And, you know, eventually figure it out, but, um, this can happen for non-diabetics as well, but do you want to, do you have some science behind this? Do you want to talk about, or not really just, basically no. just like, um, it's, it's characterized by a blood sugar drop less than 70. So if you do, you know, check your blood sugar, or if you think that you have reactive hypoglycemia, there's another, um, more specific term for exercise induced hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. That's a long way of just saying when you start exercise, your insulin spikes and your blood sugar plummets. And Mm -hmm. it usually will happen within the first like 30 minutes of exercise for most people that experience this. And it can be diagnosed if you, in fact, I just had a phone call yesterday with a potential new client who's struggling with this right now. You know, she, her, her endocrine function is fine. She's not diabetic, but she has this reaction during exercise and even outside of exercise where her blood sugar will just plummet out. So she's wearing a continuous glucose monitor and trying to catch some of these trends so that she can better prepare and troubleshoot for that. And to me, it's fascinating because it just shows that, you know, even though we do have all this evidence and these guidelines that each individual is a little different. And if your body is telling you that something is off and it's not working properly, let's find a way to, to fix it. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, to, to help alleviate those symptoms. So, yeah. So we have a couple of those different things. Reactive hypoglycemia is simply within like two to four hours of eating a meal, your blood sugar plummets. And that's not typical. Usually your blood sugar will raise after eating a meal and then it'll gradually kind of even out and just kind of hold steady until it's time to eat again. This is more like your the bottom falls out where right. you're having like you know, severe shakes, dizziness, or fainting, um, even like severe nausea, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and that, that's a good way to describe that. Cause for me, I never thought about it in that way, but that's exactly what it feels like that the bottom falls out mm-hmm. just shaky and weak. And I always feel like the description I use is I feel like a, you know, like a, how a plant looks when it's wilting. Oh, that's yeah. how I feel Whew. just like, you just don't have any kind of energy mm-hmm. or strength to, do what you need to do, you know, mm-hmm. just uh, sweaty often kind of mm, faint and, yeah. and weak and, um, a little disoriented, that kind of stuff. That's my experience. That's a good way to say that the bottom falling out. That's exactly what that feels like. Yeah. 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 So, um, um 
What else? Sorry, I was going to say, do you want to talk about how to how to fuel for that? Yeah, I mean, basically or carbohydrates. Yeah, um, usually just starting with a 15 gram dose um, of carbohydrates. This could be like you know, uh, like half of a large banana. This could be um, in the form of like dairy or fruit or grains or whatever. I mean, anything with a nutrition label, you can see how, how much of a serving has that, that 15 grams, mm -hmm. usually straight sugar is better than the mixture. So like dairy would have a mixture of like protein and fat and a bunch of vitamins and minerals, something like applesauce or juice, or, you know, again, that, that ripe banana, um, which by the way, just a little side note that a banana that has little black flecks on the peel that's starting to get that sweeter flavor and that kind of softer texture is better for sports fueling than a green banana, mm. which has resistant starch, which can, we didn't talk much about fiber, but, um, we'll, we'll talk about it when kind of putting this all together in the picture of your day that easy, fiber more can, easily digested. Yep. Yeah. Cause the fiber can sit in your stomach and that resistant starch is exactly as it sounds. It's resistant to digestion. It just sits there a little bit longer. So, um, anyway, that's a little side note on what kind of banana to choose. If you're looking for a quick hit of, of mm -hmm. sugar. Um, but yeah, basically 15 grams of carbohydrate, simple sugars. If you looked at that graph, you'll understand why it brings that blood sugar back up um, very rapidly and then gives your body a chance to kind of normalize like, okay, we've got some carbohydrate on board. Most people will not then bottom out again. It's really mm -hmm. just bringing that blood sugar back up. So your body knows kind of how to, how to manage that carbohydrate load. So. Right. And then planning before there's some general guidelines here of for every hour before exercise, a gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. So like an yeah. hour before one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram, two hours before two grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight, <clears throat> that kind of thing. So yeah. up to three and four hours, yeah. which is why I like th when I'm going to work out in three days, I take 72 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight. <laughs> <laughs> I just grab a bag of sugar and I eat it for my workout in three days. It's a great fueling and, plan. And that way I don't, I don't bottom out. You are a, you are a planner. You're prepared. Yeah. And you think I just fly by the seat of my pants and here I am three days ahead of time eating my bag of sugar just so I'm prepared. So take that Aaron. Take daddy. That. What's that sugar for? My sports dietitian said I need, <laughs> I need to prepare for my workout. Good for my diabetes. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, the so I will be perfectly honest. I do not count my grams of carbs right. per kilo per hour. However, I think it's a good place to start. You know, some people that are maybe you just signed up for your first trail marathon. Maybe you just, you know, signed up for new gym classes that are a little more demanding than you're used to, you know, whatever mm. it is, maybe you love hiking in the fall and you, you know, want to do some longer day hikes. This is just a, a place to start to just sit down and do the math, you know, a couple hours before, and I weigh 54 kilos, you know, that's, I don't know, roughly 108, 110 grams of carbs. How, how is that? What does that look like? You know, is that a couple pieces of toast with some, you know, banana on it and some nut butter maybe, or is that like a bowl of, um, granola and yogurt with some fruit? I mean, what does that look like to me and that portion size and just start there and see how it feels, see how the mix of nutrients feels, see, you know, what sits well with you. I've had people that, you know, they've tried something like steel cut oats because they're just looking at like, oh, well it's oats and it lasts longer, right? Because it's got all the fiber and everything in it. And then they eat it before a workout and they're like, whoa, that did not go well because the fiber, again, that's one of the last things to really leave your gut. And fiber is unique from the other macronutrients that it actually has like a filling substance to it. Mm -hmm. Like you truly have plant material that is in your gut, just slowly being broken down by the microbiota, which we've talked about under our gut health episode. So it takes a while for that fibrous material to leave. It also can, you know, stimulate a bowel movement and it 
provides bulk to your stools. So it can also cause like some GI upset if you're not careful with that fiber. So that's another thing just to think about because high carbohydrate foods, um, if they're from plant sources, whole grains and that kind of thing, they tend to be associated with fiber, you know, fruit. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind as you're choosing your carbohydrate sources, you know, know what works for your body and don't be afraid of some of those more refined carbohydrate sources or those simpler carbohydrate sources with lower fiber. As you get closer to your workout, um, right. your body will be primed to use that, that sugar and that simple carbohydrate. So, and that's what you want. The point is to have it in you quick so that you don't have the bottom fall out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about post post yeah. workout nutrition. So there's, there's been some, at least as far as like the quote unquote anabolic window, um, oh, yeah. which is like, you know, for muscle gain Do or kind of, die. Yeah. There's like, there's been some, some shift in the science more recently, but there's like, uh, there's some holdouts from past studies, which is always the case. Right. So we, you know, we used to think that you had about 30 minutes after your workout to get in, you know, a good amount of carbohydrate and protein to, you know, just flood those cells in the body with, you know, these nutrients that were ready to build muscle and that kind of stuff. And then it was really, really important that we hit that anabolic window and anabolic just means muscle building. So muscle building window, yeah. um, more recent research says, eh, not as important as we thought it might be. Um, way more important. It's just, what are you getting throughout the course of a day and what does your body mm -hmm. have readily available? And mm -hmm. that if you, you know, if you're at 32 minutes, you're probably fine. Or if you're an hour or if you don't, you're probably still good. So there's mm -hmm. some, some misconceptions there. Um, but what do you, what do you do for like more endurance space athletes who are doing, you know, like hour, two hour, three hour rides, runs, whatever, how do you, how do you handle post-workout nutrition for them? Yeah. Well, you hit on the two nutrients, protein and carbohydrates that, that we're really looking for, for recovery. It doesn't mean you can't have fat. It doesn't mean you can't mm -hmm. have fiber. Um, it really just means that the science says that a nice combination of those two, particularly protein, especially as we age becomes really the focus of recovery nutrition. Um, that anabolic window is funny because I've worked with, um, just kind of casual athletes that they know I'm like the chocolate milk lady. And so they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, chocolate milk, chocolate milk. And I'm like, if you just had a sandwich, you know, I mean, have your milk with the sandwich if you want, but you don't have to be like pounding, you know, quarts of chocolate milk after your workout every day, you know, that's a little bit more along the lines of justifying certain nutrition practices because quote, I just worked out. I need it. Right. Um, for endurance athletes or really high performing athletes that are doing multiple workouts a day, or they have literally, they have a training plan that every day is a demanding workout, whether it's a long workout, whether it's high intensity, whether they're mixing it up with some weight training, and then they go do, you know, a run the following day, you have to look at the broader picture here too. So if you're, if you know yourself as being a hard worker in the exercise world, you're on a training plan, you, you go, you know, work really hard at the gym, you attend certain classes or, you know, you're part of a fitness community where you're working really hard on a regular basis, that recovery nutrition does become more important Absolutely. for a couple of reasons. One is just that you are repeatedly demanding your body perform at a certain level. And I mean, if, if we know that that anabolic window exists, it's not like your body just shuts down after, you know, 60 minutes or something after a workout, and mm -hmm. it's not going to your cells won't absorb that nutrition. It's just, why not take advantage of that window? If you know it exists, go ahead, you know, take your 20 to 30 grams of protein, you know, eat some carbs, get that nutrition in right away. You also have the benefit of your body is primed to use that fuel effectively. So it's primed to put those carbs, you know, back into storing it as glycogen back into kind of replenishing. You also have that revved up metabolism for a period of time after exercise where your body is going to need those calories. It's a nice kind of thank you to your body. Um, the other reason I would say is those top performing athletes, like let's take, you know, an Ironman athlete or, you know, even a half Ironman athlete marathoners, if you have those long duration workouts or you have multiple workouts a day, 
just thinking about everything we've talked about in this podcast to lead up to fueling for the workout and all the considerations, all of a sudden your windows of time to eat a substantial meal, you know, with lots of different nutrients and composition, your window of time to do that throughout the day becomes less and less just because you're really trying to like time it. Oh, I've got to eat three hours before. And then, you know, whatever, I've got another workout coming up. So I can't have a huge meal. I need to kind of keep it small. So that recovery window then becomes, um, again, more paramount because we're trying to get the nutrition into your body based on these time constraints and these demands on your body. So you're really just trying to minimize the deficit. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've seen athletes that don't pay as good of attention to that recovery window. And they're, they're kind of feeling that low energy state and sure we can do an analysis and look at the numbers and, and see it in the numbers that, Hey, Mm -hmm. you need to get even as little as like two, 300 calories more a day. It doesn't have to be a ton, just that, that little bit of, you know, additional fuel and where's the perfect place to put it. Let's put it around your workout because that's Mm -hmm. when your body is really, you know, primed to use that fuel. It just makes sense to, to then say like, just be prepared with, you know, a quick protein shake. Heck it could be half a peanut butter sandwich. I don't care. Keep it simple. Like just grab something that is, is easy, um, for you to put it into that recovery window. And I will, I want, I need to give a shout out to Brent Ruby. He's a researcher over at university of Montana. And, um, I might've mentioned him before he did a study years ago to look at, cause he, he's sort of, um, man, he, I don't know how to describe his approach. He's super scientific. Like he's a a nerdy researcher type, right? He's done a ton of research on wildland firefighters, Ironman athletes, hydration, all this stuff. And he has access to a lab because he's a professor at university of Montana. So he's, he's like all about doing the experiments Mm -hmm. and he got kind of tired of this whole recovery window. Um, you know, elitism, like this, eat this many grams of protein. It needs to be lean protein, blah, blah, blah. So he did an experiment to look at muscle protein synthesis and all the biomarkers after exercise. If you Mm -hmm. drink like this certain thing, I think he had three, I think he had chocolate milk. He had like a whey protein shake. And then he had a McDonald's cheeseburger and they all elicited equal like (laughs) benefits in terms of, of just like your average, you know, recovery and, and metabolic markers. So I just want to give a shout out to Brent Ruby for keeping it real and being mm-hmm. like, go ahead and have your McDonald's cheeseburger. You know, it works just as well from a nutrition standpoint. When we talk about fiber and getting enough fruits and veggies and all of that stuff, mm-hmm. that's another layer of this conversation, but just saying that anything really can help in that recovery window. Absolutely. And I think, I think, you know, what, what you mentioned there is really important that one of the biggest difference between is like someone who's working out two or three times a week for 45 minutes or an hour versus endurance athletes is when we go for these long bouts of exercise, we really do kind of burn through our glycogen stores, which is basically just our body's like reserves of energy. Like, oh, we don't have food to draw from here we go. And when we burn through those, then we don't have those later on. So replenishing them right? Like taking in more carbohydrates to replenish those stores is really important for just, I mean, just not feeling crappy later on, right? Like not feeling weak and, and kind of empty. And so that's, that's a big difference there is with those long endurance athletes is we really do need to replenish those glycogen glycogen stores. And we don't tap into those really when we're, you know, doing strength training for 45 minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, putting it together in your entire day, just to kind of tie it up and put a bow on it. I usually will sit down. We talked about this with meal planning, man. I'm referencing a lot of our old episodes. Go back and listen to them. If you haven't share them with you. a friend. I know. Um, so proud of you. I should be, I should be like head of marketing or something for our little middle-ish podcast. Maybe I mean, we I don't have one. <laughs> position is it. open. We're hiring just like everybody else in the nation. Most of the positions are open. <laughs> So, um, putting it together, I look at your schedule first, like, let's just put a loose framework of when do you work out? When do you go to work? You know, what are some time constraints you have in your day? And then you start putting together your meals accordingly. And then 
as we get a little more nitty gritty into the nutrient timing aspect, we might look at, okay, so you tend to work out right after work, maybe five 30, maybe six o'clock in the evening. That means, okay, lunch is probably fine. You know, no adjustment there. Just make sure, make sure it's substantial. It's satisfying. Maybe that's where you get like that really great combination of, you know, carbohydrates, fats, and protein and fiber and put it all together. And then maybe around that three or four o'clock window is when you have like a nice snack that has some, you know, complex carbs with a little bit of protein, like we were talking about at the beginning and see how that goes for you. Um, for some athletes I might look at, let's say that early morning workout, you know, again, if you don't feel like you can eat something before you go out for a run or before you go do your workout, maybe this is a good place for you to dabble in a little bit of that you know, what'd you call it? Perry exercise fueling <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where you I mean, in the middle. Yeah. During, yeah. yeah. During where you, um, you know, maybe you take a bottle of sports drink with you to the gym. Maybe you take, um, you know, some kind of sports food. Maybe you even take a banana to have like partway through your workout, yep. something like that. So that you, at least, you know, sometimes that movement and just getting going is enough to stimulate your appetite. And one of the worst things I think is to get partway through a workout or to get started and then realize that, oh my God, I need to eat or my stomach yeah. is rumbling or I feel kind of like dizzy. Yeah. So, so maybe that's a good time for you mm -hmm. to sort of plan. Mm -hmm. Maybe I won't eat right before the workout. Maybe I'll kind of save this and start nibbling on something partway through my workout. Right. I have a client, or I guess I still have him. Uh, but when I was working with him in the gym, um, up in Oregon, he would bring his half a banana, you know, he mm -hmm. ate half before and he'd bring his half with him, and always around 30, 40 minutes in, he'd be like, I just need to eat my banana real quick, finish it up mm -hmm. and a few minutes. And he'd be like, okay, I'm good. I'm ready to go. You know, yep. but yeah, absolutely. Because there's, I mean, it's, it's really worth playing around with and seeing what works. If it means that you're going to be able to have a stronger workout, a better workout, one that you're more dedicated to that you can finish, you know, if you're going to the gym all the time, all the time and mm -hmm. 30 minutes in you're toast, or you're just feeling like crap. Mm -hmm. And then you're feeling like crap for a while, because that's the thing is when this happens, if you do tank, you usually don't recover super quick. You can feel kind of crappy for a bit, you know? Um, so it's worth playing around and seeing what works for you. And that would be my, I guess, my bow on top. What were you done with your bow? No, I, I actually wanna... haven't. I have another okay. bow to put on it after what you just said. So go you ahead and tie your, your bow. Well, oh, you, you want me to? Bow. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so the, the other thing I was going to say, I, I do have another example of a, a friend who, would go and swim and then she'd go do her run workout immediately after the swim. So we're talking like it was a 90 minute to two hour session every morning. And we had a, a plan to have something in between those two sessions. And so again, just to reiterate your point that reiterated my point that there's lots of different ways to do this. I'd like to I reiterate also think, that point. Yeah. Let's reiterate <laughs> everything. I know our audience is going to get bored with us. You said, a really important point about you'll get more out of the workout and you'll feel better doing it. I mean, what are we doing people? Are we exercising or training just for the sake of punishing ourselves and gritting through it? Or are we trying to make gains in some realm of our lives? Are we trying to get fitter? Are we trying to get stronger? Are we trying to get to the start line and the finish line of whatever event? Yeah. So if you feel better, not just physically, but mentally, if you can focus better on the intervals of the workout or, you know, the structure of the workout, whatever you're supposed to be doing, if you can be engaged in that activity through proper nutrition, I think it's a no brainer. I think it's mm -hmm. something that is unfortunately, we talk about this a lot. It's kind of prolific in that diet and fitness industry that you got to like, you know, grit it out and punish yourself. And it's supposed to be hard and miserable. And you're supposed to blah, 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 do all this stuff and make it harder on yourself. To me, that makes zero sense when you're not going to be getting as much out of the session. If you do that. And right. I'm not, 
you're not going to get as much out of your day either, because it's very likely that you're going to crash when you, you know, get to work later and you're, you haven't Mm -hmm. fueled properly, or you'll lose motivation in the Mm -hmm. afternoon if you haven't fueled properly throughout the day. And so then you don't want to go work out. And so, or you'll start snacking late at night in front of the TV because you're so damn hungry because you didn't Mm -hmm. support that activity earlier in the day. So there's all kinds of negative ramifications that are working against what you're trying to accomplish. If you yeah. just completely ignore or disregard some of these very basic recommendations, that's my bow. Yeah. yeah. If you heard that, that suggestion to eat during a workout and your thought was like, well, wouldn't that be defeating the point of the workout? If I'm taking in calories when I'm trying yeah. to burn calories that I'm very serious here, please email Aaron and I, cause we would like to talk you through that and get you away from that very disordered thinking, because that kind yeah. of thinking is only going to work against you in some really profound ways. I'm being very serious. Like yeah. we would love to talk you through and get you free of that kind of like being bound and controlled yeah. by food and 70 calories, like mm-hmm. seriously, like it's important. So if you had that kind of knee jerk response of like, Oh, wait, 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 wait please reach out to us. Cause we would love to talk to you that. Cause it's, that's a really hard place to live and an impossible place to sustain. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I had a bow, but that's it now. It was, that's I was going to say bow. something else, yeah. but that's a better bow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good so stuff. you got a meaning in the mundane meaning in the mundane. <sighs> you know, I had one and it was last week and I'm trying to remember what it was. It was after we recorded <laughs> last Friday too. I think it was a week ago mm-hmm. we recorded. Yeah, we're all sorts and of off. Yeah. I I can't think of it, but I it'll come back to me. I know. What? I know. Dun, dun, dun. I would, Go I ahead, would like Michael. to just sit in this moment for a second. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and just revel Shut up. in it. It just feels really good to be the only one prepared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aaron's not happy with me right now. So I will stop calling attention to it. Just stop. (laughs) So for me, uh, this weekend, it was Sunday, Sunday morning. Uh, We were down at the town home in Galveston and the, there's a deck there that overlooks the bay. And, you know, you can see like fish jumping and people kayaking and going boating. And in the evening, the sun sets right off there. It's awesome. But we were all just kind of sitting out on this deck. My parents were reading. I was reading books to Sophie. Lada was reading a book. I don't think Kathleen was out there, but it was just like, when we go down there sitting on that deck, it's just, a, it's a fun thing. Right. And usually the girls are playing and goofing around and stuff, but it was just kind of this quiet, serene moment as they were all reading. And I was, you know, kind of quietly reading to Sophie and you could hear the water and the birds and just this beautiful view. And it was just one of those moments where we just stopped for a moment, you know, like I just mm. had, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds where I just took it all in. I was just like, man, this is a nice moment, you know, mm-hmm. with my parents here and my girls so happy that they're here. Cause they just have such a great relationship and I'm happy they're here and we're all out there together doing our different things, but sharing it. And yeah, it was real cool. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's like one of those, do you want to just pause time? Mm -hmm. and try and, you know, make a, I heard a story once about a little girl making a, she stopped and closed her eyes and her mom asked her what she's doing. And she's making a picture memory where you, (laughs) where you just are like, can I I just remember the sounds and the smells and the feeling Mm -hmm. and everything going on in this moment and just really embrace it so that I can draw back to that place, you know, and get really vivid with it. I think it's good. Yeah. I remembered mine. All right. So I had to just make sure I had the date right because I was like, I think I don't want to double up and bore everybody with another um, snapshot of my life. But anyway, this is probably going to sound really similar to others, but we, Matt and I went for a ride last Friday and he came home from work and he was kind of like, Mm, do you want to just hang out, watch TV and just kind of keep it chill? And I was like, no, you know, let's go. It's beautiful out. Like we'll just take it easy and go for like a short ride. So we rode from our house and we just did like a really short loop 
And then we were like, well, let's go check out. There's this, you know, food trucks are becoming the thing in Boise. And there's this mm-hmm. place kind of further down the green belt. We're like, we could ride down there and check out this, this food truck place, but it was getting somewhat late. And we just weren't sure, you know, how late they're open and it's kind of, you know, further away. So then we'd have to deal with like the lights and the writing in the dark and all this stuff. And so we ended up at a local brewery and just, you know, let's hang out and just have a beer and then go home. Maybe they sell mm-hmm. like popcorn and peanuts. You know, we could just have that for our right. speaking of recovery food, beer and popcorn. <laughs> and that's Aaron's plan these days. Uh, and I like it. So we, we got our beers and we sat down and Matt, as we're parking our bikes, Matt's like, Hey, there's an empanada truck across the street. There's this Argentinian food truck that just happened to be there on this block where the brewery was. So we had this Argentinian food and it was so good. Mm. I mean, we were both just like, what a, we love Boise. Like what a (laughs) lucky, what a lucky find. And yeah, you know, just enjoyed each other's company and Mm -hmm. hung out for a while. And, you know, they've got the lights out on the patio and it was still warm enough that you could just sit outside and bike shorts, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, Matt was, Matt was talking about how fun that night was, he was like, man, last night was so good. Like that evening was just so fun. And I think that spontaneous kind of unexpected, um, just those moments that, you know, the, and I think that's kind of the, why we do this meeting in the mundane, because it really brings to light those moments that are just unexpected, or they seem kind of ordinary. Yeah. Let's like, just go you know, grab a beer at this place we go to all the time, but it just, there's a specialness to it, or there's, you know, something that comes out of it that you're like, man, I really appreciate this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, we did a whole episode kind of on the the point of the me and the mundane, but I think it's good to like you're doing now kind of revisit it every now and then, because I think that's the beauty of it is that it's not big moments. It's these really simple, small things that probably happen a lot more often than we give them credit for and recognizing the joy in that, like, it's not, you know, the big trips or the big events. It's the, you know, having a really good empanada, man, you know, like, honestly, and they were really good. (laughs) Matt went back and bought another couple of empanadas. (laughs) Right. Because like when you have a bite of something that's just really good, or you have a moment that's just really nice, like, Mm. man, those are I think that life is made up mostly of those things. And if we miss them, we miss out on a lot of goodness. And if we can tune into them, life is fuller and richer and more beautiful and more satisfying. And so, yeah, just a good, good reminder there, Aaron. Good job. Yeah. Kind of remind us of why we do that. Yeah. Even though it took me a while to remind myself of (laughs) what I was going to talk about, but I'm going to do some soul searching today and see if I can find it in my heart to forgive you. I'll let you know. Send you a text later. Okay. I'll be on pins and needles waiting for that text. (laughs) I I'm sure you will. All right. Thank you everybody for listening and, Mm -hmm. um, let us know if this was helpful information for you and pass it along to somebody who could use, I think this one in particular is probably something that people could, could get some, you know, get some value out of. And so Mm -hmm. some good applicable information. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.